It's a war outside. It's a war outside. It's a war outside. And everybody acting like they don't see it. Crazy off the shit I ponder. Journey into millions. Well, let's get into it. Hello, Black. Episode 108, you know what I mean? Black August here rocking. Uh, somebody call it the People's House, as uh, Delancey calls it. It's uh, Camp Muta King. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Where you'll get your mind right, you know what I'm saying? We ain't roasting no marshmallows, but we getting our mind, camp, yeah. body, and soul right. You know, but we bent. can. We can, Mark. We can. We can. Uh, we can. <laughs> We said roast marshmallows. Yeah, yeah we can roast some, roast some marshmallows. You know what I mean? At some point in time, I don't know. <laughs> That's an idea. This is a full circle moment. It is. It is. I remember our first, our first uh, hella, hella black uh, podcast. You know, I was talking about uh, free your mind and your ass will follow. That's what you we're know? doing up here, training the mind, so our ass gonna follow. Yeah. Well, listen. <laughs> you know, we got there's a path, and the, and the path has been blazed by many giants before us. So. Only thing we're doing is following that path, you know, uh, trying to put some bricks on that road. That this, this red and white, right, red, white, and, bl- and black uh, road, uh, brick roads, you know. Yeah, I mean, if you think about where we are, you know, in Douglas Town, people might, you know, have to do some research to figure out exactly where that is. But you know, we in Douglas Town, long history of uh, abolition. That's right. That's right. He was one of the great abolitionists uh, uh, in the United States. You know, he really set the map. In terms of what it means to be an abolitionist, and what it, what the word actually really, really determines that, you know, for for us in regards to abolitionism, I think we have to take it into the 21st century. You know, we have to abolish a lot of stuff, now, not only just the issues of slavery. And not saying that slavery has been abolished by uh, that great abolitionist uh, or and his participation in it, cont- contribution towards it, but um, uh, because we know that slavery still exists, particularly in, in the penal system. So uh, for us, um, in terms of the issues of abolitionists, of being abolitionists, right, our, our goal is to abolish everything that is anti-black, you know, it's anti-people of color, anything that creates a situation uh, or an environment that is uh, in opposition to our own prosperity and survival, you know, living in this particular country, in this country. Uh, so, uh, yes, the tradition has been laid. You know, the, 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 the history is well established, you know, what it means to be an abolitionist. And uh, what we have to do is, like I say, we stand on those shoulders. Uh, we have to build that red, black, and green road, uh, brick, you know. Um, you know it's, not, it's not the yellow brick road to, to Oz, but it is the red, black, and green road uh, to, uh, to liberation and freedom. Waiting us right to New Africa. Yes, sir. That's right. New Africa, bro. You know, you were a very distinguished guest, second time on. There's not too many people who come on Hello Black two times in the span you came on. It's like 10 episodes or so. It don't feel, yeah. <laughs> it don't feel like 10 episodes ago. It don't feel like 10 episodes. It don't even feel like the second time, but that's because we've been in here for, you know, eight eight or so days. Every day feel like a podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> for real. We, we've been sitting at the dinner table. Yeah, talking. Shopping game, learning. <laughs> but I think back to, um, what was that last summer when you was doing the video? Um, calling for his release. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, for that us, protest. Yeah, and so to go from there to doing the um, free your mind and your ass to follow to being able to be at be at you know camp camp Jalil yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> camp Jalil <Jaleel. laughs> camp with Akeem and we be building. That's wake I up, never wake did. up, make eggs, do push ups. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's some it's some real building in here going on. And yeah, so the thing and that was probably like fourteen months ago because I think that was what June. Or July. Mm-hmm. It was June. Yeah. yeah. It was June. Yeah. 14, 14 months later, we, we in here. We're here rocking. Recorded episode 108. Eating good. good. Living good. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we, we do the best we can under the system of oppression in which we are fighting against, you know. We got to make the best of, of our situation. And unfortunately, we have to stay healthy, you know, and also that we can provide uh, the nourishment that our movement needs, you know. So it's all part of the process, you know. Our sister, uh, uh, Sophia Bukhari, she wrote a book, uh, uh, the war before, and in that book, she made explicitly clear the necessity of the need for uh, revolutionaries to take time for for self reflection and for healing. You know uh, that if we don't do that, then ultimately we'll burn out. You know, and so uh, we have to recognize that this is a um, uh, a marathon. This is not a sprint. 
And if we understand that in terms of our struggle, then we know that uh, uh, self-healing is all part of the process. It is part of the revolutionary process. And one of the reasons why it's part of the revolutionary process is because uh, we have been traumatized. You know, the system traumatizes black people. It traumatizes people of color. You know, it is designed to traumatize. You know, and so for us, the, the our struggle for liberation is healing. It's a healing process. You know, and it's a way for us to uh, render ourselves free of the kind of traumatization that we have to encounter on a daily basis. Whether you go into the grocery store or department store and you're being followed, you know, uh, just because you're black. Right, or you have to concern yourself when a police car passes by, you know, whether or not he's going to stop and search you. You know, these are little dynamics that accumulatively, you know, create the psychological uh, uh, issues of, of traumatization. You know, and uh, not only that doesn't go to the issues of what's going on in the community itself. You know, these are some of the smaller things that are accumulative of going to own trauma. Uh, and dealing with the issues of white supremacy, you know, and racism, institutional racism in this country. Uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, we do have to take time for uh, the process of reflecting and understanding our strengths and our weaknesses in order for us to uh, uh, continue, you know, continue to struggle. Yeah, that, that's something that I know me and, me and B have been trying to um, round Figure ourselves in. Yeah, because, mm-hmm. you know, it's, I don't know, you, just, you get so caught up in the work, um, and another OG of ours, uh, in addition to yourself, that be giving us a lot of game, is is left. Um, and he he told me to treat myself like I treat the people in terms of taking care of myself. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's that's something that I've definitely tried to ground myself in. So to hear you say that, it's a, a necessary reminder. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that was smart though. Treat yourself like you treat the people. You ain't gonna treat yourself bad, right? You can't treat the people bad. Yeah, yeah. I'm feeling that energy. That's right. So we have a Black August. It's yeah. a special, special yeah. time. Yeah, uh, monumental time. But you know, can you dive into the meaning of Black August? I feel like there's so many uh, articles on Black August. You know, from people who don't know the true history, like how you know the real history. Mm. And even um, yeah, I was gonna say even what what our pod, you know, the one that we did was this last episode? no two episodes. We did a ago? couple episodes. Yeah, what we touched on on Black August, um, and I asked you if. We misinterpreted it, and you said not misinterpreted, but we might have did a reduction by not, you know, mentioning the BGF. And so we definitely want to, while we touched on the way, well, I guess we mentioned the BGF because we mentioned Qatari, we mentioned George, sure. to really being sure. able to be precise right. with our analysis and right. our history for the listener. So if you listened to 106, you know, we gave y'all um, some of the history, but, you know, we missed some key elements in our Jaleel. Yeah, one, one of the key elements in terms of uh, Black August is how it evolved. Um, as you well know, um, one of the significant aspects of it is that it's a commemoration of uh, the, uh, the heroic efforts of Jonathan J- Jackson to try to free his brother on August 1st, 1970. The man-child. The man-child, that's right, the man-child. That's what he called him. And uh, what George called his brother, or referred to his brother as the man-child, uh, making that heroic effort to, uh, in the Marin County Courthouse uh, to free William McLean, Jan- uh, excuse me, William Christmas and James McLean, and also uh, who came along was uh, Rochelle McGee, uh, and uh, the tragic uh, ending of that. Although Rochelle survived, he's still in prison today. You know, he's been in prison for almost for about 58 years as a result of uh, that that particular incident, and he's still fighting to to free Rochelle McGee. Uh, but also, a uh, Black August commemorates uh, Comrade George, you know, and his assassination, his his murder on August 21st, 1970, 1971. Uh, but more, and, and just as importantly, it commemorates the, the death of Jeffrey Katari Golden, right? And Mr. Golden, or Brother Golden, or Comrade Golden, he was, um, some say, and you know, some confirm that he was the leader of the Black Gorilla family, you know, that he inherited that position uh, to lead the Black Gorilla family. And so after his death, after the, the, the CDC, uh, San Quentin, allowed him to bleed out right in the San Quentin uh, Adjustment Center yard, he had hit his head. What happened was he, he had um, he was playing a little game of football uh, or passing the ball, and he tripped and fell and hit his head on concrete. And, uh, in order, and before they were allowed to get his body out of the yard, he bled out. And uh, that was kind of devastating for everybody, uh, knowing that this young, this young brother who was stouch, a stout uh, supporter of black people 
and um, and building uh, in defense of black people, particularly in the prison system that was uh, uh, California prison system was uh, had to confront uh, uh, Aryan nations, uh, Aryan Brotherhood, uh, various other gang organizations, the Mexican Mafia, and, and etc. Who are, for the most part, at that time, uh, particularly uh, 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 the Mexicans, those Mexicans that was there, Chica Chicanos, uh, was in, in in alliance with um, with the Aryan Brotherhood, you know, in certain instances, and it was and so it was necessary it was ne out of necessity. Uh, that the, and also the, the guards, right, or white supremacists. So it was out of necessity that the, this organization called the Black Guerrilla Family came into existence in defense of their own selves, in defense of uh, black people, you know, in that kind of um, environment. And so uh, the loss of, uh, of uh, Brother Qatari uh, was, was rather devastating uh, for uh, BGF. And that's when they decided they, had, they needed to, to commemorate, right, um, his death, Comrade George, uh, and, and Comrade uh, Jonathan. And in so doing, they looked at the, the month of August and saw all the other things that happened in August uh, uh, in history of black resistance. And so uh, Black August is, is basically that. It is commemorating uh, black resistance in the United States. And, and for many of those who did not know, uh, Black August has been going on for 50 years. You know, so now it is a tradition, and it's a tradition that we have to honor in the history of black, of black resistance in the United States. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, over this. I, I would say I've heard about it, but this was this was the um, the first year that I really dove into it and committed to you know the fasting, committed to exercising daily, committed to increasing my reading and my studying, and then increasing my organizing. Um, Freeing that drink too, yeah. man. Oh you know yeah, I, mean? I forgot. <laughs> I ain't had alcohol. <laughs> the most menial of the of the of the sacrifices, you know, no liquor. But hey, it's um what, what we tried to preach on our on episode one hundred six. What we really want to take wanted folks to take away from it was mm -hmm. the importance of organizing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, falling so through on the commitment. Yeah, falling through on your tasks. You know what I mean? The other stuff really... could be kind of performative. You know, like the not the not drinking, the the fasting. But like if I'm what am I doing in addition to those things? Because that's just t 10 hours out of the day. I'm not allowed to have food. Or, you know, from sun up to sundown, I'm not allowed to have food. 31 days, and I'm not allowed to have no liquor. But what did I really do in the name of black resistance? Sure. You know what I'm saying? Sure. But also discipline. Discipline, you know, for sure. That is that is the idea, uh, that you take this month and not only reflect upon uh, the, uh, the history of black resistance, but you discipline yourself. You know, you test yourself and understanding that uh, what you're doing is not in as much as it's purifying. When we talked about healing just a few minutes ago, right? That's part of the process, you know, uh, that we are taking the time to really reflect on uh, who we are and what is our positions in regards to the conditions of our people. Uh, and by doing so, taking that kind of uh, deep introspection, uh, then we'll be able to really uh, uh, solidify. Right for uh, ourselves, internalizing for ourselves that we are, at least in part, are revolutionaries. Right, we're moving towards and evolving towards becoming revolutionaries, and that that is the course. That is what Black Resistance is. You know, is uh, building and organizing and uh, uh, forging a movement, uh, a revolutionary movement. Yeah, that discipline is so important. I feel like discipline. Um gets kind of like I guess for lack of better words a bad rap because when you think of discipline it means like you're losing yeah. something but I found so much or more or people think about <laughs> like, it as like yeah. a classroom oh you're getting disciplined in the class yeah. or, you know you're but, acting up at home and your mama disciplining you but not having that that internal discipline that discipline for, for revolution organizing you know means you're going to maintain yeah. discipline don't necessarily be punishment yeah. <laughs> and it don't mean the loss of anything either yeah. it really like for me I feel like I've, I've gained a new focus a okay. new understanding uh, and developed in home craft and, and skills, you know? Sure, sure, sure. So, yeah, so we appreciate it. Uh, I was fortunate enough when I have been out, uh, since I've been out for the last 10 months, uh, that I was able to introduce Black August here in Rochester. Uh, it was the first time they have an opportunity to celebrate. And I ran into some very good, very good uh, uh, activists here in Rochester. Uh, many of them belong to FTP, uh, Free the People, uh, organization called uh, Citizens for initiative, Citizen for Initiative Justice, I think it is. Um, uh, Urban League, I also support it here. Um, we have um, Citizen Action Organization that hired me when I got out of prison. Uh, we have, uh, um, what's another organization? I mean, I got it written down here. Let me see if I can find them. I don't want to miss any of them. 
that, that would be improper. Um, healthcare education, that's the union. That's uh, uh, 1199 joined in this. Um, the Black uh, uh, Gender Group also joined in this. And um, Vocal, Vocal New York, the Rochester chapter of Vocal New York, uh, also supported um, the work that we're doing for Black August. And so uh, our first Black August, we did a showing of Comrade George's uh, uh, story. And I did. That was this the beginning of this month? That was on the first day of, of, of August. Y'all kicked uh, it off right there, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the only way you can start Black August. If you don't talk about Comrade George in the first day, and, and that whole dynamic on the first day of, uh, of August, or at least the first uh, event for the month of August, then you have really missed uh, uh, what Black August uh, uh, comes from and where, where it evolves from, and uh, that kind of level of resistance, you know. And so, uh, yeah, we did. We started off with um, a showing of, of uh, a story about Comrade George, and I gave a presentation uh, on that and allowed the, the various uh, sponsoring organizations to also make presentations. Because it's important for the, the people to see that we are building collective. We're building organization. We're building unity and uniformity. You'll hear me say that often, right? That in terms of our growth and our development uh, of, of, of resistance, that is extremely important that we have unity and uniformity uh, in the language in which we use in regards to our, our struggle. Uh, we've also, um, we was going to have an art show. Unfortunately, we had to, uh, to cancel that because uh, the person I wanted to showcase uh, had conflicting uh, um, uh, scheduling, uh, conflicts in, a, in our schedule. Uh, but we did organize uh, or are organizing a, a block party for the community. Uh, we're doing a uh, field uh, field day where we're going to be passing out, I think, uh, as much as 1,000 food packages and book bags uh, for the young people, right, which is very good. There's a guy here in Rochester by the name of Anthony Hall, and I got to give him a shout out because he, he allowed us to use his platform uh, to uh, push uh, Black August. And so he, he deserves another. He's been doing this book bag and this, uh, this um, field day. Uh, for several years now, you know, so I'm fortunate to have met him, met this young man, met this brother, and uh, and explained to him what Black August is about, and he said, "Yeah, man, come on, bring it," you know, and uh, and then we're going to also have uh, what we call um, uh, a day of um, uh, the heal the hood. Yeah, heal, heal, yeah, heal, heal the good hood. Heal, heal for <laughs> healing for a good hood. Yeah, that's what it is. Healing for a good hood. And uh, in that, we will have some yoga, we have some reiki, we have some martial arts, uh, and uh, meditation. And the reason why is because our, our community has been so traumatized uh, by racial violence and also inter internizing uh, uh, struggles that goes on in our community with these street gangs. Uh, and, uh, no, and no, without a doubt, because of police uh, um, terrorism tactics in, in our community. And so they have been so, so terrorized that we have to take a time all right, to really reflect on that and, and look for the ideas of how do we deal with this trauma. And so we bring you know, those individuals and those organizations who, who are, you know, professionals uh, in that particular area in the community, bring them together, bring the community together, and let's talk about it. Let's do some of this, some of the things that try to uplift the spirit, you know, and deal with the psychological trauma that we have. Of course, not one day it's going to deal with it, but at least it, it gives us the opportunity to have a pause. You know? Start building some of those tools, you know what yeah, I mean? In the foundation, yeah. for sure. Yeah, ab absolutely. And so that's what we're doing for Black Arcus here in Rochester. Um, you also gave your first uh, public uh, speaking engagement too. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Yo, yo, <laughs> yo, I'm not. I'm not a public speaker. You know what I mean? I got. I got a little stutter, and uh, so I'm. I got that too. Don't trip. Yeah, don't trip. Okay. Well, don't listen, trip. man. You know, it, it is. It is what it is. But. Uh, yeah, I did my first uh, major public speaking event, and uh, it, it went all right, I guess. You know, <laughs> I, I didn't get criticized too much. You know, nobody did run away, didn't run away from me, so <laughs> I guess I did all right. Yeah, y'all yeah. been doing some um, some really good work out here. It's it's been super motivating, like to to, to see you get up and organize, um, to witness some of your meetings, and we'll be able to go to um, the block party on Friday. Is there something Thursday? No. Uh, no, we don't have anything on Thursday. We have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Yeah, we'll, we'll be able yeah. to go to the block party on Friday. Um, yeah, yeah, y'all, y'all, y'all getting it done. Yeah, well, listen, you know, we feed off each other. You know what I mean? Uh, this is what our movement has to do. You know, we have to be inspired. We each have to inspire each other in order to go forward. In order to push the, the push the agendas. You know, uh, you guys in in the Bay, 
uh, uh, neighborhood program. You guys are an excellent, excellent example of what it means to build something that is going to be sustaining, you know, uh, substantial to the community. Uh, and particularly in regards to the issues of uh, building decolonization programs, you know, and that's what we're going to try to do here, uh, begin the process of building decolonization programs. Uh, and my thinking is that if we can build decolonization programs across the country, you know, uh, then create a network of that decolonization program, we'll be setting up the, the foundations for uh, uh, establishing the means for which we can really empower ourselves, you know, uh, become free in, in regards to structural development, institutional development uh, that's based upon the ideas that we can uh, provide for ourselves, you know. Part build, of the build that united front across, you know. From New York to here. Hey, listen. I mean, if we can get if we get to that point, uh, we will have uh, really did something uh, phenomenal. You know, it's, I, I, in my thinking, beyond the Black Panther Party and what they was able to achieve within the six to seven years of their existence, their real existence and power, and, and empowering our community, uh, there's only been one major uh, uh, national organ, organizer, right, uh, who had uh, had the kind of um, impact. Uh, the uh, it's historic, right? And that would be the great uh, uh, Marcus Mosea Garvey and his uh, Back to Africa uh, movement, his uh, UNIA, um, United Negro Improvement Association. And that organization, what he tried to, and uh, what he did accomplish, and the reason why he became a threat to the system was that he was able to galvanize an idea uh, amongst black people in not only the United States, but in Africa, and uh, in uh, Europe, uh, and throughout the Caribbean and Latin America, you know, uh, no organization, to my knowledge, right, has created that kind of um, a national and international uh, uh, determination amongst Black people, and that's one of the reasons why he had to be destroyed. Uh, the movement had to be uh, diminished, you know, as a result of his capacity to really challenge the. Uh, the idea of uh, white supremacy, right, and empowering black people uh, towards their own idea of black freedom. Yeah, so we're making those errors. We're going we're gonna to make this happen, you know, slowly but surely. Uh, we're going to build decolonization programs uh, across the country, you know, whatever name they may come under. Hopefully at some point in time uh, we'll be able to um, build them into a united front, a national united front, you know, uh, maybe if it not be falling out front for liberation of the African nation or some other um, named entity, uh, the, the golden objectives have to be the same as as has been being promoted by front for the liberation of the African nation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boss, you want to tell the listeners, you know, what we've been doing in terms of people's programs for for Black August, in terms of events and, and ways we've stepped up in our organizing? I mean, I think, you know, launching the health clinic, getting that going, um, that's a huge, a huge win in terms of uh, not only serving the people, but um, showing the propaganda of it too, showing out and pointing out the contradictions. Right, we city of Oakland spends millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars every month on the police, and the people don't have health care. You know, so I think that's that's a big, uh, big accomplishment that's going to happen this month is having that truck in the field, uh, having doctors, having having nurses. Um, what else we been doing? We've been doing so much. I, I can only think about the, the past two weeks. When do we do the, the power with Michaela? Did we talk about Acorn Day on there? Oh, yeah, we did Acorn Day. You should talk about Acorn Day. We did. Yeah. Uh, and so... And give some history about Acorn and, and where it's at yeah, for, for people not yeah. familiar with uh, with Oakland. Acorn is uh, the projects in West Oakland, uh, the only projects of, of, of Oakland. But um, they're, they're, a, they're a place that's that's really... I would say cut off from the re the rest of the city in mm -hmm. terms of resources. Um, they don't have any grocery stores down there, and folks would like to say that since Mandela Grocery is on Seventh, which is you know down the street from the actual projects that that's they a grocery have, yeah. store. But people who say that aren't aware of like gang wars. Mm. Um, you so, stepping into a whole different neighborhood going yeah, down there. A, it's a whole different neighborhood, and so I would say they're they're a place that's cut off from resources um, in terms of no after school programs for the kids over there. It's a bunch of kids that, that stay over there, as you can see from us being over there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a food desert. Um, what's the nearest hospital? Maybe Highland? Highland. Highland. Yeah. Um, and then I think about schools. Um, Only high school over there. high schools over there. A so bunch Mac. is closed. Well, Mac. Yeah, Mac, which, Mac. Is, which is also another arrival neighborhood, right? Yeah. And so they don't have many schools. Um, they don't have any grocery stores. Mm -hmm. 
and community centers closed yeah, down. The community center is, is closed down, and of course, you know, folks like to chalk it up to COVID, but I would have to assume, you know, if we look at the history of anti-blackness um, and discrimination against the poor in that area, mm-hmm. I, I can't chalk it up to, to COVID. Yeah. And so, you know, we trying to build with the young folks. Young folks over there definitely want to shout out Lingo and Sean for allowing us to to work with them, and you know, they had their hood day. Uh, which is 18 to celebrate the blocks from you know 8th to 10th street um and so you know we brought in backpacks um and then we were also able to bring in the sinaloa taco truck and you know it's not it's not uh, i think what people forget about this is i think people will look at this as charity and it's not charity because the cats over there that have found found a way to to survive by any means necessary they do a good job of taking care of their community cool. but i think um like all other folks you know it it is the the job of the city to pour resources into them and so we want to show that like you know they ain't got to do it all on their own mm-hmm. and that you know, people gonna pour about, resources right back into them as yeah, well if we're talking mean? about you know free the people free the land mm-hmm. uh, the total liberation and unification of, of all africans you know them is the people we talking about and so mm-hmm. we trying to build with them hopefully that's the first of of just a few programs you know this friday is going to be the first time we take groceries into the projects mm-hmm. and so i think that's another um Really big step in, in the right direction in terms of nation building. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Very so we've got the grocery program going this whole month. Uh, Sunday's program feeding the houses every month or every week. You know, so continuing to build those decolonization programs this month and really deepening our commitment. You know, a lot of people on core is uh, fasting for the first time. You know, giving up alcohol, giving up drugs or weed, if you want to call that a drug. Uh, <laughs> some people just say it is. Some people say it isn't. You know, uh, don't discriminate. I ain't a smoker myself, but definitely. Uh, Proud of proud of folks for you know deepening their commitment this month. You know what I mean. That, that's that's something that we got to do every month. You know yeah. what I mean. But this month as a as a place to really refocus. You know I think uh, even for me and you, us deepening our commitment um, and like reading what was it on liberalism or combating was, liberalism. combating liberalism. You know what I would mean? say that's and one like, of the biggest. That's one of my biggest yeah. things for Black August that I'm taking away is like, all right, me I, I got to always put everything about the politic and command within the organization and not have. Uh, peace for the sake of well, unity. Explain that. Explain that to you to, uh, to your your listening and, and and viewing audience. What does it mean to me to keep politics in command? Well, how, how do you translate that? It's at no at no at any juncture you never waver. It's that you always keep the ideologies in 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 place, right? Like you don't. So like let's say for example we believe in scientific socialism. If boss is coming with something that ain't scientific, I can't. Be he can't not because he's my friend. Just because you know, just, you know we a co-host, we co-chair. Like, yeah. You know, I, I, I got to stand on that. Like, hey, fam, your your analysis is off. Okay, you know what I'm saying. Okay. Or if we talk about being revolutionaries, you know, we can never waver. And if somebody's wavering, we got to say, yo, you being liberal. Okay. That's keeping the politics in command. Keeping politics in command. You know, I, I remember a um, um, a statement made by Sada Shakur, right? Uh, and uh, one of the statements she made, uh, particularly she was addressing the uh, women, uh, feminists, and in uh, the movement. And she said, she told women, particularly uh, uh, women in the party, she said, uh, uh, if you're a revolutionary, you cannot have a, a non revolutionary man. You know, uh, that you, if you're going to be a revolutionary, then your partner has also has to be revolutionary. And in that instance, you're developing a relationship that's based upon revolutionary, keeping politics in command. Um, and it's important for us to understand that our relationship that we have with one another, uh, you know, whether it be a personal relationship or, you know, association by, by virtue of uh, the circumstance for which we uh, are surviving in, uh, we have to make sure that those relationships is based upon the struggle. It's based upon how we uh, reinforce the idea that we are, in, in fact, uh, uh, what I use the term, either emancipators, abolitionists, or liberators. Right, and uh, and deciding who, those kind of relationships, it builds character, right? It builds our personality and understanding the the the, the sacrifices that we not only the sacrifices that we're making, uh, but also the the pleasure in being be able to provide the kind of programs that you are providing decolonization programs for our people, you know, to be able to empower our people, and and keeping those politics politics in command, fighting against liberalism, right? How do, the proper way of dealing with contradictions is extremely important. And those contradictions also lends to your personal relationships that you have with your partner, you know? Uh, how do you resolve those contradictions? Because you cannot allow those contradictions to hinder your capacity to engage in movement. And that's the reason why, uh, one of the reasons why that Asada made that point very clear, uh, uh, that um, whoever your partner is, 
if they're not about the about the politics, if they ain't about the, the struggle, then how are you gonna be able to trust them? How are you gonna be able to have that kind of uh, emotional bond with them when they don't see the vision? They don't. They they're not looking at the world in the same eyes in which you're looking at the world, you know. Uh, so uh, that is also part of the process of keeping politics in command. Yeah, it, it, it goes that deep. It goes. It, it becomes that internalized. You know, by keeping politics the man, they spawn your own personal relationships as well. Yeah. Hey, I feel like that's super important. Otherwise, you know, you can be taking this direction, taking this direction, taking this direction. And if your goal is to free the land and free the people, you always got to be centered in that. Yeah. In every, aspect of, every aspect of your life. Yeah. You know? That's a fact. That's a fact. I agree. Yeah. The highlight of my Black August has been Cat Muta King, <laughs> coined famously by me. <laughs> um, <laughs> nah, it's, it's definitely definitely been my camp, highlight too. Yeah. Right, like and it remind me. I'm telling you, it's August. It's the time for fall camp and football. Like it's just, I'm having flashbacks. Yeah, you get ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing, like this is literally what you do. You know, you lock in. You cut. You cut out from the outside world. Oh, yeah. We ain't we. If we've been here for. A, what I mean, I, I lost track of time when you said, "What have we done this month?" I'm like, I feel like we just been here the whole month. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. we reading, studying, it's uh, having real, conversation, real and really vibes, really being able to learn. You know. Downstairs in the, you know, working that, out, working like, out, getting that mention, you know what I mean? <laughs> Eating big ass meals, like I'm telling you, bro. It's like, you know, reloading on your on your it's carbs hot, and protein. Humid out, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I haven't done anything like this since the summer of 2014, my last year of college football. I'm huh. telling you, like that's hella camaraderie. We just we eating every meal together. We talking, going over the playbook, yeah. watching movies. It's like that's you know that's yeah. that's what we've been going. That's what we've been doing. Okay. I definitely felt that the. the um, Elevation in, in spirits and skills and outlook. So I'm t- telling you, you got you got something going here. If you ever, you know, want to not keep the politics in command, start your little Airbnb. revolutionary camp. <laughs> start your little revolutionary camp. You know exactly how to do it. Tell you, man, you, you well, I, I'm glad I'm glad to have my cousin here and and you also <laughs> the the Lancey here for because uh, you fam too and here for in, in, at my at my place in my residence and. Uh, and I, again, I am fortunate. I, I feel blessed, you know, to, to have been out in ten months and be able to have this kind of space, you know, for where we can have our comrades come together and just uh, chill for a minute, you know, chill, study, you know, eat, relax, uh, re-energize themselves, uh, so they can go back out in the field and get back to work. Yeah, yeah, and so, we, yeah. Go ahead. I was just saying we we've been learning a lot, and I, you know, I know you say you ain't a, a quote unquote public speaker, but you know, I, I've heard. Somebody told me that, you know, you might be having a podcast come out pretty soon. And you're going to be laying down audio and laying down, you know, some true, real uh, revolutionary education that, that points us towards throwing on, that points us towards freeing the land uh, and having true independence and true sovereignty. So, you know, to all our listeners, we're going to post it and y'all better support, like, for real, for real. Otherwise, I'm not. Nah. <laughs> nah, it's important, though, because the biggest thing is I feel like so much... It, so much that that we learn about um, folks like yourself that that was, you know, a part of the party. Um, you we, we get it through just like books. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. it's I've never been able to sit down with somebody that I know made the ultimate sacrifice. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've never had that 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 privilege, that opportunity. Well, it's not the ultimate so ultimate sacrifice is being martyred. Yeah, in the, in the who who would have so. made the ultimate sacrifice? Right. Uh, you know? we, who has? No, oh, I said oh. you would have made the ultimate sacrifice oh. had it had it had know. it gone that way. Yeah, easily, yeah, yeah, easily. Yeah. There's uh, several times that, that possibility ex- yeah. existed. You know, by yeah. the grace of God. You know, when I say Allah, by the grace of Allah. You know, I was spared uh, for to continue to do the work. You know, uh, it was just was not my time. Yeah, know, but uh, yeah, um, and we we'll continue to do the work. You know, I was an organizer before I came into. the uh, the party, you know, I, I grew up in uh, uh, in a household where my mom uh, was a uh, an activist in the NAACP. She used to drag us around in those marches back in the days, you know, <laughs> and when I was a kid. And uh, and then I became a member, uh, an organizer of the Black Student Union High School. And eventually uh, I uh, came into uh, engaged with the Black Panther Party and was recruited into the Black Underground. Uh, black Underground, Black uh, Underground became known as the Black Liberation Army. And the Black Liberation Army is, goes through a long tradition, a history of armed struggle, black people armed struggle, from the Reverend, uh, uh, the great Reverend Nat Turner, you know, to the, uh, um, uh, uh, the African Blood Brotherhood, uh, to the Dickens of Defense, you know, to Robert, uh, um, uh, woof, Williams. Robert, Robert Williams, to Robert Williams, you know, uh, and he wrote a book called uh, Negroes with Guns. 
you know, or have the capacity and willingness to fight against the Klan and can fight against white supremacy. And so uh, the Black Liberation Army is following that, in that tradition in, in defense of our, uh, of our lives, of our struggle. You know, you got to remember the Black Panther Party original name was Black Panther Party what? For self-defense. For self-defense, you know. And so by the origin of its existence, uh, and its existence, it had already in, put in this program, uh, the Black Panther Party, at some point in time, actually was rule number six, that no Black Panther Party member can join an underground organization except for the Black Liberation Army. So when uh, um, uh, Huey and uh, Bobby uh, put, together organ put together a party, uh, they knew that at some point in time, armed struggle would be part of the processes of liberation. And so, uh, yeah, and so at the age of uh, late 18, going on 19, I was recruited into the Black Underground, uh, the Black Liberation Army, and um, as a result of that, I did nearly 50 years in prison. Uh, so while I was in prison, I was organizing, you know. In prison, I organized and created uh, several campaigns. Uh, first first uh, uh, national newspaper that came out of prisoners called Armed, Armed Spirit. I organized that while I was in San Quentin. Uh, I initiated the first uh, petition to the United Nations while I was in prison in uh, San Quentin and carried it up forward when I was paroled from San Quentin and sent to uh, California, uh, sent to New York uh, State Prison System. Uh, continued there. Uh, I organized the first uh, national march. Well, not the first national march, but a one of the national march in support of political prisoners uh, that resulted in the building of the Jericho Movement. Jericho Movement has been in existence now 21 years, 21 years, uh, fighting for uh, and, and building uh, in, in regards to the existence of, of U.S. political prisoners, you know, the premier organization that supports political prisoners in the United States. And we just got some good news about David, too. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. A result of the, our continuing fight, uh, and certainly uh, David had a lot of support from various other organizations, including Jericho. Uh, David Gilbert, if you know, those who don't know him, uh, David Gilbert uh, was a member of the, uh, he first was a founding member of the SDS, a student from Democratic Society. And then he evolved and he came involved with the uh, Weather Underground in the 60s. And as a result of his engagement with Weather Underground, uh, he eventually became involved with a, a group of individuals, uh, was a coalition, I guess you might say, a coalition of uh, black revolutionaries and white revolutionaries, um, and was uh, uh, instrumental, some of them were instrumental in, in getting, uh, uh, freeing uh, uh, Salah Shakur, right? And uh, ultimately, I think it was in 1981, if I remember correctly, uh, they uh, engaged in expropriation, uh, tried to uh, rob a, a Brinks truck. Uh, to support the the underground movement, and unfortunately it went array, uh, and uh, two individuals were murdered or killed. Uh, a, I think a prison guard and a, and a cop, and a, and a, and a comrade um, was also murdered uh, by the cops, um, and several people was, was arrested, and David was one of them. Um, David received um, uh, 75 to life sentence, 75 years to life sentence, and he did not have a weapon. Um, I don't think he was a driver. Uh, he was a getaway driver, and that's all. He had no engagement with the law enforcement at all. You know, no direct engagement with law enforcement at all uh, with his expropriation. But they gave him 75 years of life. They try to make an example out of this white man, you know, who uh, opposes uh, his white skin privilege, who opposes a uh, white supremacy, who opposes uh, American anti, who opposes American imperialism. You know. And they try to make an example out of them. So uh, recently, after doing 40 years, right, uh, this, sometime this week, uh, he was granted clemency. So now he has the opportunity to go to the pro board and hopefully be released. His, uh, his, uh, his, his wife, uh, Kathy Bodine, was released, I think, 13 years ago. You know, she was also part of the, uh, uh, that, mo that struggle, that movement. Uh, Seku Odenga was released, I think, about five years ago. You know, doing a federal and state uh, prison sentence uh, as a result of the Brink, Brink robbery case. And he was released, I think, about five years ago. So in New York State, uh, David was the last, quote, unquote, political prisoner in New York State. And so we have a, a great opportunity uh, to see him being released from prison. And that's people power. People fight and continue to fight for the release of our political prisoners. And so, um, so David hopefully will be released uh, within the next month, maybe two months. Uh, hopefully, let's see what the pro board does. Uh, again, you know, like I said he had 75 years to life. Uh, he did 40, 
and uh, was given a clemency. And so we'll see. That what, what clemency did, he wasn't given a pardon. If he was given a pardon, he'd be released from prison. But he was given clemency. That gave him an opportunity to go to the parole board. Uh, but we still have other comrades in prison. We have uh, Sheikh uh, 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 Imam Jamil Alameen, right, um, who's been in prison. And his story is, is extremely important for the people to understand uh, because he's innocent. You know, he's a person has already uh, confessed to the crime for most of the time, over like for the last 21 years, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, and they're still holding them. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mutulu Shakur, you know, the great acupuncture, a black acupuncture. He started a whole organization for black acupuncture uh, before his arrest. Uh, he is the, the stepfather of Tupac Shakur, right? Everybody who's loved Tupac Shakur should be fighting for his stepdad to be released from prison. Uh, we have, uh, uh, so of course, we have uh, Sunyata Kohli. Uh, Sunyata Kohli is, what, 84 years old. Uh, and uh, now I think many they say he's suffering from dementia, right? And he was uh, one of the individuals who was uh, arrested at, at the same time that Asada Shakur was arrested, right? Uh, he's been in prison ever since, and he should be released from prison. And there's many, many more uh, that we are fighting for. Maroon, uh, 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 Russell Schultz, uh, he's in, um, in Pennsylvania, and um, we're trying to get him out because he's dying. He's dying in prison. And we don't want to see another one of our comrades die in prison. Uh, but he has cancer, uh, terminal cancer, and uh, we just tried to make an effort to get him a, a passionate, compassionate release. Uh, the state denied it. You know, uh, you know so we're, 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 we're in a fight. We're in a fight to release our political prisons, but we have to uh, build a strong, durable people's movement you know, to fight for the release of our comrades. Yeah. You know, I know when you was down, you was talking about petitioning the United Nations. Um, and now in October, you have the uh, tribunal coming up. Uh, can you talk about, you know, the history of that tribunal, the importance of the tribunal, and, and what people can do to, to support it? Absolutely. Um, it's not the first time we had the International Tribunal come to the United States. Uh, the campaign that I launched uh, to the United Nations back in 1977 uh, in 1981 with other organizations it resulted in the international uh, uh, international jurists to come to the United States and they visited uh, many of the uh, comrades inside prison including Sundiata including uh, Leonard Peltier uh, one of the great uh, uh, indigenous uh, uh, warrior uh, in the United States um, uh, um, and, and other uh, individuals they visited and they made a determination back then that political prisoners exist in the United States so in uh but there's no remedies. There have never been any remedies as a result of the COINTELPRO war on the movement, on those who have been convicted uh, as COINTELPRO conv convictions. Uh, there has never been any remedies, although the uh, Church Senate Committee had determined that the acts of the FBI uh, for COINTELPRO were illegal, right? Well, it was unconstitutional. But they never established any remedies for those who were convicted uh, for those COINTELPRO illegal and unconstitutional practices of the FBI and, and other police forces across the country. Uh, so, um, in 2018, I was locked up in uh, 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 Southport Correctional Facility uh, in isolation, 20, 23 hours of lockdown, uh, uh, segregation, as a result of me teaching a class in uh, Attica. Uh, they didn't like me teaching the class, or they didn't like what I was teaching in the class uh, uh, about the Black Panther Party and the history of struggle in this country. And so they locked me down uh, for four months. Um, and while I was locked down in isolation, I decided it was time to bring the international jurors back to the United States. And so I put out a proposal, sent it to my comrades in uh, a Jericho movement, and uh, Sister uh, Bukhari, Sophia Bukhari, and Baba Herman Ferguson, another individual who has a long history of struggle. He was my elder um, uh, back, in the, back in the days, uh, uh, came to uh, visit me at uh, Eastern Correction at Eastern Correction Facility. No, no, excuse me, not, not Eastern Correction Facility. Well, I get my times mixed up. Um, uh, two, no, 2018 uh, was uh, Jihad Abdul Mumet, and members of Jericho Movement came uh, and visited me. Uh, when I talk about Sophia Bukhari and uh, Baba Herman Ferguson, I'm talking about the, the first uh, UN campaign, uh, mission, uh, Jericho Mo Movement to Jericho in 1998. That's when they came to visit me. So anyway, 2018, I put out a proposal. Jericho jumped on it and said, yes, we'll do this thing. And uh, we have now come to 2021. And uh, October uh, 22nd to the 25th, 
uh, we will be having the Jericho, we will be having the International Tribunal. Uh, the International Tribunal is that we charge genocides. Uh, we charge genocides again. Um, uh, the uh, International Tribunal is, is commemorating the 70th anniversary of when uh, Paul Robeson and um, William Patterson first uh, brought the charges of international, brought the charges uh, to the international community, particularly the United Nations, of the charge of genocide. That was on uh, December 15th, uh, 1951, two months after my birth. Um, and so we're, again, bringing the issues of uh, uh, we charge genocide. Because the conditions that they argued and fought for back then in 1951 are very similar to the conditions that exist today. And so uh, we have several charges. I want to read these out because I think it's important. I can't keep it all in my head. I got so much in my head right now. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I be feeling. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, the, the, the charges are um, racist police killings, black, brown, and indigenous people, one. Uh, Hyper-incarceration of black, brown, and indigenous people, two. Uh, political incarceration of civil rights, national liberation era revolutionaries and activists, as well as present-day activists. That's three. Four. Uh, environmental racism and its impact on black, brown, and indigenous people. Five, public health racism and disparities and its traumatic impact on black, brown, and indigenous people. And six, genocide, black, brown, and indigenous people as a result of historic and systemic charges of all of the above. If you look at all these charges uh, cumulatively, right, we note that they diminishes the capacity from which black, brown, and indigenous people have been be able to prosper and survive in this country. And so we are um, bringing these charges to the international community, uh, having an international jurors come to the United States. Uh, right now we have the venue at the uh, Malcolm X uh, Betty Shabazz Center uh, for the tribunal. Uh, we have judges, nine judges, uh, representing the international community who are listening to the testimony uh, and documents uh, that we will be presenting. Uh, Sister uh, Nikichi Taifa will be the main, uh, and we use the term loosely, but it is, nonetheless, it is the term prosecutor, prosecuting the United States on the issues of, uh, of genocides. Uh, and then, of course, we demanded the release of our political prisoners. And so um, this is going to be historic, right? This is going to be an opportunity for us to not only uh, raise the issues of, uh, of um, uh, our condition inside the United States uh, in, in respect to the issues of genocides, but also create the international solidarity with our movement, you know, with our fight here in the United States. And if we can build that dynamic uh, for the world will understand what our fight is here in the United States, then I think we will create the kind of uh, uh, conditions by which when we engage in struggle uh, uh, here in the United States, that we have the kind of support and backing uh, between progressive forces in the international arena as well. Yeah, can, can you tell the listeners why this specific charge of genocide is so important in terms of, you know, the role that it's playing in understanding, like, the dialectics of revolution? Yeah, I mean, well, all people have the right to fight for the for their national liberation and independence. I, their, their, uh, their national identity. That's a right. That, that's a right. That's a human right. And so we are raising the question that this is, in fact, a human right. Uh, but what what is also important is understand what, what is genocide? You know, how does that function? How does that operate? I'm going to read from, from my book, um, uh, we are all liberators. Why I made a a point of raising this question and raising this issue, uh, so we have a, a, a fine understanding of what it is, what we, what charges that we're making, and why we're making these charges. Uh, let me see if I can find a page. I thought I had it marked here. Um, I marked here somewhere. Uh, bear with me. Um, Uh, yeah, and so we, what is more, more, what is as important in terms of the charge of genocide is that the United States is guilty of um, engaging in this particular practice. Um, here we go. The International Convention on Prevention of Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Here the International Court states in Article 2, in the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part the national, ethnic, racial or religious groups, such as one, killing members of the group. We know they've been killing us, right? B, causing serious bodily and mental harm to members of the group. We know we have suffered on those, on those occasions. 
on all those occasions, uh, issues. Uh, C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. All right, and that's the part where it really gets me. Um, uh, because if we just look at the issues of mass incarceration is one of the charges that we raise, hyper-incarceration, we know that they're sending uh, our young people to prison at an early age, at an early age, and keeping them in prison 20, 30, 40, 50 years, all right? And those are their, their most productive years uh, to reproduce, right? And so they're preventing our reproduction in that level, uh, on that degree. If you, if you even just call, uh, uh, ask Alexa, Right. Um, yeah, I'm serious. Just ask Alexa, uh, what is the population of black people in the United States? And they will say something like 13 percent. It's been 13 percent for the last 50 years. Right. In terms of our population in the United States, we have not grown from, from 11 to 13 percent. We have not grown in 50 years. Right. That's in whole and in part destruction of the people. Right. Uh, imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group. We know that they've been sterilizing our women. Uh, we know that there's a history of sterilizing, especially uh, Latina, Latina ex uh, women, uh, the Puerto Ricans. They have gone through uh, that. Uh, there's a, a, a an argument right now in California state prison system, where they were sterilizing uh, uh, the women inside California, particularly black and Latina so women in uh, New York uh, in California state prison system, sterilizing women against their consent, right? Not giving the consent to be sterilized. Right? The the idea of eugenics continues today in regards to uh, killing, uh, uh, preventing the birth uh, of, of black and brown and indigenous people. And uh, uh, lastly, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. We know they've been doing that as well, right? Uh, a lot of that is uh, uh, sending our babies to foster care, right? And, and, and those kind of things across the country, you know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's epidemic in the way that they are, we are being treated in, in conditions that amounts to genocide. Now, Article Three further states that the following shall be punishable. Genocides can be punishable, right? Genocides. Two, conspiracy to commit genocides. Three, direct and public incitement to commit genocides. Direct and public incitement to commit genocides. I'm going to go back to that in a minute, right? And att attempt to commit genocides and the complicity in genocides. Uh, and so when we look at, for instance, uh, conditions like what happened in Tulsa, right, and various other uh, uh, cities that were block controlled or, or areas of block controlled and how white people rioted it, rioted it against black people, right? Murdered black people. Uh, well, we see those, those, uh, the hanging trees, you know, where they're celebrating, uh, the, the, the lynching of black people, you know, uh, we, uh, not only did it have a, a traumatic experience for black people, I was talking about trauma, traumatizing black people, right? But it also indicates to how it reinforces the idea of uh, a white supremacy, you know, and devalues and diminishes, dehumanizes our black lives, all right? And so uh, when we look at the historically and the cumulative value, or cumulative conditions from which uh, um, uh, 1951, uh, the great Paul Robeson and William Patterson uh, uh, brought the art, brought the charge of we charge genocide to the United Nations. Uh, we feel that today, uh, particularly with state terrorism, uh, state police terrorism, and the killing of the black people, whole uh, uh, wholesale killing of black people across this country, uh, that is need. We need to take this this charge of genocide to the United Nations, to the international community once again. And that's what we're doing. October twenty second to the twenty fifth, the International Tribunal of two thousand twenty one will be held in New York City. It is historic, and every Every progressive organization, and individual, should endorse and support it. You can go to Spirit of SpiritofMandela.org and learn more about it. Also, you can endorse it too, so you know people can get funds to uh, for for the programming. You know what I mean? So go ahead and endorse it. Hella Black has endorsed it. People's Programs has endorsed it. So you should too. <laughs> you fuck with Hella Black. If you fuck with people's programs, you need to be fucking with the tribunal. If you fuck with the people, just generally, if you fuck with the people, fuck with the tribunal. So we're going we gonna to put the uh, link in the episode description in the uh, YouTube and whatnot. So make sure y'all tap in. Um, so why do you think that the tribunal is important, you know, for the new African independence movement as well as um, getting involved in the international arena? Uh, why, why do we see that as important, you know, for uh, Republican New Africa? Uh, well, I think I think it's important on, on several several accounts, uh, and I, I want to make that transition uh, by um, sharing my thinking in regards to the issues of Black Lives Matter, 
right? Black Lives Matter is essentially a, a, a social consciousness movement. It is not a movement movement, right? It's a social consciousness trend for the most part, right? And it came out of the, by virtue of the idea that uh, black people's lives have been so dehumanized and, and, and diminished to the point where it was necessary for us to even come up with the idea of uh, the, the value of, of black lives, you know, that we have to raise that question. And I remember back in 1968 uh, when they had the uh, sanitation workers strike uh, right before the, the, the killing of the assassination of Dr. King, and the sanitation workers had to walk around with a placard, body placard, that says that I am a man. Why? Why would it be necessary for black people, black men, to even have to announce that, to wear a placard, to say, identify themselves that I am a man? Right? And it goes a lens to, to what degree from which we have suffered as a result of white supremacy in this country. And so for us, the charge of genocide uh, today lends to the idea that perhaps it is time for us to really consider um, uh, divorcing ourselves uh, from the realities, right, of white supremacy and Americanism, right, as 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 uh, El Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X used to call it, Americanism, um, and so uh, for us, uh, uh, the black uh, the the International Tribunal is a means by which we can begin to uh, build uh, towards the, uh, the goals of creating an alternative narrative uh, to the corporate. A Democratic Republican Party. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be moving towards uh, uh, ultimately in 2022 is building what we call the People's Senate. That's what Jihad Abdul Mument has called it. Uh, we'll be moving towards building a People's Senate. Uh, we want to create a new narrative, a third voice, right, of liberation and independence. And for me, for me, part of that third voice is also building what I call Frolin Now, or Front for the Liberation of the African Nation. Uh, I think it is in time that we really consider uh, our own independence, uh, moving towards these to the conditions from which we can uh, become an independent people. Um, if you look at what happened on January 6th, right, when the white supremacists stormed Congress, right, uh, trying to take over Congress to nullify uh, the, the process of what they call a democratic process of voting, which is a sham. Uh, <laughs> corporate uh, election. Huh? Yeah, corporate election, exactly. Two corporate parties, uh, Democratic <laughs> or Republican, they're both the same. One called, one, uh, uh, as Hodgman says, one called the wolf and one called the fox. <laughs> you know, uh, they both belong, belong to the canine family. And so and when we understand, <laughs> understand that, um, we know that we have to begin to divorce ourselves from each of those parties because they don't necessarily work in our best interests. Uh, the interests of black people, or poor people, uh, the best interests of brown people, and indigenous people in this country, and so we have to create a, a new uh, uh, an alternative. But at any rate, on 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 January sixth, they announced what they what they're about: the white supremacists. Mm -hmm. right? They had a whole coordinated attack. Coordinated. It wasn't the spur of the moment. No, no, it was no, coordinated and it was, was organized. And, and we know that it was seventy million uh, uh, people voted for Trump, you know, and and avowed white supremacists. 70 million people across this country. And I can imagine there's probably 30 million who are silent. You know, that's one third of the entire population of the United States. And so, given that reality, uh, they're not going, they're not going to disappear, right? And we have to be prepared uh, in our future goals for our babies, right? Uh, to think about uh, excising ourselves uh, from this reality. You know, we have fought for too long trying to become part of something that don't want us. Right, be part of America that has never, has never worked in the best interests of black people. And so we have to begin to start thinking um, uh, in terms of how are we going to build something uh, substantial uh, for our own liberation and independence. Now, why is that foreign? Is that a foreign idea? Why can it be a foreign idea? We have sovereign nations in the United States, right? Unfortunately, they're not functioning and operating as their full capacity, but Native Americans, many of them, are sovereign nations, right? So saying that there is no sovereign nation in the United States is, is, is ridiculous, right? And so for us, in terms of international law, right, the international law that states that we can, in fact, move towards building our own nationality and our own nation, mm -hmm. right? And so we are using international law as the premise from which we can build towards independence. Uh, Frolinan, Front for the Liberation of the African Nation, uh, can be a tool, an right, organizing tool, to make that happen. Um, as some may know, many may not, 
1968, 500 uh, revolutionary nationalists, black nationalists came together, and they decided they're going to move to our understanding that the five five states in the United States, called the Black Belt states, uh, uh, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana, there's the Black Belt where the majority of black people still reside in the United States. And where black people is naturally, you know, migrating back to them. They are migrating back to them. In fact, you have one uh, bourgeoisie, Negro, bourgeoisie <laughs> black person uh, uh, by the name of... Um, is it Charles... Yeah, Charles Blow or something? No, no, no. Uh, was it Charles Blow? Yeah, Charles, yeah, Charles Blow, uh, Blow, who wrote a book uh, uh, that emphasized the idea of the exodus back to uh, to the Black Belt. But not with the idea of sovereignty. And not with the idea of sovereignty. <laughs> the idea of probably black capitalism. Black capitalism. Right, right. right. Well, so that's the reason why I say, you know, pseudo uh, uh, bourgeois. Uh, but the idea that he thinks that we need to do so and raising that within his circle of people, you know, uh, we need to give a, a narrative to that idea, you know, of independence. Uh, so it is not a far-fetched idea that we need to return back to the, to the Black Belt South and take it over. Right, take it over. Right, build uh, the institution. Like I can say decolonization programs that lends to the idea of empower, empowering ourselves uh, 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 for for liberation and independence. Right, I have a theory, of course, that is part of my book. We are own liberators, uh, called Three Phase Theory for National Independence, and the Three Phase Theory of National Independence states in, in, uh, very succinctly uh, that um, the first phase is is. Uh, 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 class struggle for national unity, right? We have to engage in class struggle uh, because the, the capitalist system creates classes. It creates divisions. Especially right? if we're looking in, like, Atlanta right now it's where you have a, 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 you feel me, a, <laughs> you have a black mayor, you got black cops everywhere. I don't know, the first time I was in Atlanta, I was like, bro, what? Yeah. All these black police officers? Yeah. And people yeah, act it's like it's like, studio. oh, we, we free, black Mecca, whatever they want to call it. And like, yeah. nah. Wakanda. But that's why class struggle. Yeah, so we have to engage in class struggle. Class struggle for national unity and if we can build this kind of national unity and start building the kind of decolonization, decolonization programs across the country uh, and build these, uh, these institutions of self-empowerment, uh, then naturally we can see the idea of self-government. Right? So it's class struggle for national unity, national unity for self-government. Right? We start creating the institutions where we are, in fact, in control of our own resources and uh, the capacity for which we can build uh, for our own degrees of sovereignty. And as we build those kinds of institutions, uh, independent institutions, uh, we'll be building the, towards the idea of naturally, uh, the natural goal and objective is uh, self-government uh, for national independence. Right. So it's a three-part process, right? and each process lends to greater empowerment and the liberating of our minds, so we liberate our bodies. Right. Then liberate the land. Liberate the land, free the land. So with that, we also need cadres, you know, and organizations to be able to uh, to build decolonization programs. So we have different organizations, you know, in Oakland to to L.A. to Rochester. Right. You know what I mean? So uh, can you talk about the importance of, of building cadres um, and building decolonization programs to, to build that process that you're talking about? Yeah. Um, naturally, uh, Frohlin Land is. is it's a two part. It's a two tiered or two structured organization. Um, the cadre development aspect of it is to get in where you fit in, right? Uh, for those who are like minded individuals who understand the necessity for organization, uh, for self empowerment, uh, that we will build the inst- the kind of uh, uh, grassroots organizing across the country. That's what you guys are doing in, in the Bay Area. Uh, cadre development, cadre. Uh, 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 building, and what it does, what cadre building does, it, it creates the kind of uh, um, uh, fallback um, organizational structure where we know that there are groups of individuals in, in the community who are functioning the capacity for which uh, they are promoting and propagating the idea of liberation and, and revolution, revolution and liberation. Uh, and so, cadres, uh, you know, it can be small groups, uh, individuals, ten, fifteen, you know. 5, 10, 15 uh, group of people, but they're, they're solid in the understanding of their purpose, right? And it don't take a few people uh, to really make things happen. And so we know that uh, in terms of security and the need to organize something substantial and knowing that we will we'll always be under attack as we ha- always have been, it is important that we have a durable uh, uh, group of individuals 
uh, were purposeful, intentional, deliberate uh, in their organizing for liberation. So that's cadre development. And we strain these cadres together. We build these cadres together into a capacity from which we have an organization. Uh, it may not be an organization, you know, a formal organization in, 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 in uh, structure, right? But it would be a formal organization in, in mind, in thinking, and in, in identity, Right, which is extremely important. Uh, as we grow, as we grow, then we can start begin begin to, uh, building autonomous regions, right? Uh, liberated territory, and build the kind of front organization. Now we're building structure, right? Trying to build a, a, a national front organization, what we call Front for Liberation of the African Nation, uh, and have the capacity to really engage uh, our opposition, right? Our opposition, white supremacist opposition, capitalist opposition. Uh, for our liberation and freedom, so we have to begin the process of beginning as, as as minimum as minimum as a cadre, right? And as we do so, we can build uh, into the kind of organization that is solid, that is strong, uh, and that understands the the, the essay, purposeful, intentional, and deliberate. And, and one major takeaway I get um, from we are own liberators is, is that the structure, of course, but also the discipline. That is needed to be, you know, in a cadre, which I think when I read that and trying to apply it to my life, that's it's made my life better. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's made me sharper. It's made me more smart. It's made me a better organizer sure. you know, as I've made that commitment to, to myself, but also to my organization and also the people. Right, um, so can you talk about the importance of, of discipline within in cadre organizations? Wow. Um, discipline has to be internalized, right? Uh, I already made, made made one point in regards to what uh, a lesson from Asada Shakur, uh, how to internalize your your working relationships with, with people that you are engaging with, right? But discipline is basically that, right? It is uh, being purposeful, being intentional, uh, uh, and uh, uh, being deliberate, right? In regards to who you are, identifying who you are, and sticking to that, having the discipline to be able to challenge yourself as well as challenge the, the comrades. Around you, right, in regards to their own capacity uh, to engage in struggle, we have to identify our weaknesses and uh, uh, um, diminish our weaknesses and build up on our strengths, right? Uh, that goes to the issues of criticism, self criticism, and how that plays a part. But discipline is that you adhere to what we said before, right? Politics and command, right? When you keep the politics in command, then you are disciplined. Yeah, 1,000%. Yeah. It's important. Uh because I, th- I think what, what any cadre should be thinking of is that it's bigger. What the individual should start to think of that is bigger than the individual, then the cadre should understand that it's bigger than the cadre if you're talking about a movement, right? Absolutely. Like We all got to be strong. We all got to be able to contribute in the ways that we need to contribute. We need to have strong and solid decolonization programs. We need to have a firm and solid and deep understanding of the, ide- of the ideologies, and we need to have a firm understanding of the processes to mm-hmm. revolution into building for all in on. Because if we have 50 cadres in 50 cities... Oh, yeah. All with similar mindset. Oh yeah, you feel me? Yeah. Even if it, if it's twenty people dedicated in each cadre, yeah. you you got a uh, ability to really fight and uh, advocate for independence mm-hmm. through your daily actions as an organization as a person. There's one chapter in the book of We Are On Liberate. It's called Commitment Is Key, right? And so in terms of a- actual idea of discipline, one has to be committed, right? And I, I just want to read one one a couple of paragraphs on this uh, this idea of, of commitment. Right, pages like one fifty eight. We have one page one fifty eight exactly. Yeah, you got it. I had to study that thing. You You got it. it. (laughs) A boy encyclopedia with it. Make sure y'all. Make sure y'all. If you got the book, it's on page one fifty eight. Tap in with with the Kindle. You know, there's a new version coming soon. I heard. I don't know, but uh, hopefully it will be. All right, but commitment is key, and it says against this background. And what I was talking earlier, it should be clear that the first step of any group of people seeking to build a national liberation front and a revolutionary cadre organization must be the decision to each individual in the group to commit himself or herself to a collective protracted struggle and dialectically, a dialectical developing relationship with the revolutionary social forces, the oppressed masses. All right? That's a commitment. The group must contain those who are convinced of the need for revolutionary social change and who out of sober reflection, right, of the concrete experiences of the recent past have become convinced that spontaneous rebellions, and understand what I'm saying here, 
spontaneous rebellions, revolts, and confrontations, no matter how many or how spectacular, lead not to revolution but to despair and confusion unless an organized group takes the lead and is ready to make this commitment out of their own volition, out of their own personal volition. So over the years we have seen uh, our people uh, engage in insurrections. Right, uh, they respond episodically uh, to like to police killings, as an example. Right, and those and rightfully so, for sure. Oh, yeah. rightfully so, but it's it's an emotional response, right? And uh, it is it is a response. It is not revolutionary actions. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and we got to understand that. Right, and so for those who have taken uh, understanding of that, right, they have to make a commitment uh, to turn that that energy, right, those spontaneous revolts. Uh, those insurrections and turn them into a movement uh, and build organizations out of that, right? And so that's what we're talking about here when I say key, a commitment is the key, that we just don't respond episodically to different instances and, and circumstances, but that we seek to uh, uh, um, motivate people, inspire people uh, towards organization, to or towards organization and building those kind of organizations that would be sustainable and uh, in, in raising consciousness and building that consciousness out into a mobilization. Yeah, and All that's right? why... Uh, political education is so important because I think even early on in my political education, mm -hmm. I was responsive or reactionary in some ways how I felt, um, where I'm just following each protest to protest to protest. But yeah. now I'm like, as I became, edu became educated, I think I read uh, To Die for the People. I'm like, all right, now we actually have to build programs that serve the people. Yes, you know man. what I mean? So I think a lot of times we, what we saw this past summer is a lot of mobilization, but it, we need to turn that mobilization into organization as, as a Kwame Trace. Very good point. Right? And then turning Very that good. organization this is an example, building that cadre, right? right? Building that decolonization programs. That's how you, in my mind, that's how you make it practical. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Right. Even if it's two people. Yeah. I think one thing you said earlier was like, oh, it could be a small amount of people. Yeah. I think people overlook that sometimes. It's like, oh, we need all these people. It's like, yeah, the masses will move, but if we become organized and build those cadres, we'll, we're going to move the masses. Yeah, that's, you know? that's a fact. And that is, that is the idea that we should be organizing moving towards. You know? And it, it is a symbiotic relationship between the organizers and the organized, right? Uh, and so if we understand that relationship that we have with the people, then we know that we have to be in and amongst the people. We have to understand that people are the motive force in creating history. People are the motive force in creating history. And if, they under if we understand that, then we know that our relationship with the people is extremely important, you know, because there cannot be history, cannot be a, a movement building without engaging the people. Right? and having them understanding that we are operating and working in their best interest and that they are engaging in the struggle in their best interest and in the interest of their children, the generations that come, come after. So uh, commitment is the key, and we need to be able to have that kind of understanding of why we're involved in the struggle in the first place. Right? Uh, what is the main focus either individually uh, for that kind of commitment is love for your people. Right. If you ain't got love for yourself and you don't got love for your people, then you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong uh, 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 arena, right, uh, of struggle. Right. But love for your people and love, love for yourself first, right? Uh, you got to love yourself, right, in order to be able to have the kind of uh, uh, sacrificing love uh, for your people, you know, yeah. Can I end it with a quote? All right. This is a quote from you. I don't know if you remember this, but I'm going to go ahead. Mm -hmm. It's from you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if people do not decide to take responsibility for the type of society they want to live in, then they shouldn't complain about their oppression. Mm. Free the people, free the mm. land. We are all liberators. Episode one one oh eight. Hell black. We got some push ups to do. <laughs> <laughs>